Respected and honourable brothers and elders, many of us perhaps would have woke up to very unfortunate and very brutal news about a very despicable and shameless, senseless act which took place in New Zealand. Perhaps many of us have been aware of the news and subhanAllah it's very chilling to think that someone could commit such an act of terrorism against innocents who were just simply worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, at this current moment in time, they say that there's approximately 49 people who are dead. 49 people. And subhanAllah, it was an attack over two particular masjids in the Christchurch area of New Zealand. One was Al Noor Mosque and the other one was the, uh, the Linwood Islamic Center. Now, obviously, our thoughts and heart and our kind of you know, du'as go out to those innocent families. You know, that's first and foremost. But as Muslims, obviously, we have to raise some questions as to exactly what causes such things and how should Muslims respond to such situations. Allah forgive, you're going, people are now sending things and sharing things on social media. I mean, this guy, subhanAllah, he tried to, as if he tried to reenact a call of duty scene. Like he was actually, he actually live streamed, subhanAllah. Look at, the, look at the thinking of this individual. I don't know whether even to call him an individual or to call him a, a subhuman species. But to, to actually create a live feed of going around and innocently shooting people. Similar to that of Call of Duty. Where subhanAllah, some of these games, if you've seen them, it shows you as in the person going around and you're physically, you're fighting and shooting people. So he, but then when you analyze some of the clips, when you read some of the news, subhanAllah, one of the things which he starts off saying is, let's get this party started. A party, you're referring to that as a party, let's get this party started. There's so many sort of like little layers upon layers that we're hearing about and it makes you think, was this person even human, I mean was he insane? what was then that person's thinking? But there's the questions that beg that for example, what can push someone to that level of hatred that they can do such an act? Even they said that they found one of, they found one of his, uh, one of the arms that was used, the gun that was used and he had like for example now uh, that Alexandra, the Alexandre Bisonet, if you don't know who I'll mention in a minute, and the other guys were that Luca Traini, if that's how, if I pronounce his name right. The former basically, right, the Alexandre Bisonet, what he basically did, he actually did an open shooting in a masjid in Canada. In 2007 he did this, in January, he killed six people. And he wasn't even that old as well. If I'm not mistaken, he was only in his 20s. And same like Lu that Luca Triani as well. He, he, even though he didn't attack a masjid, this one, the first one was attack was in Canada, the second one was in Italy. And he opened fire and he actually wounded and hurt six African migrants. Now, this guy actually had the inscription of the names of these individuals on his gun. And then it said there, uh, refugees welcome to hell. And there were other names on this particular piece where that, was, he, that made reference to people in the past who stood up in resistance to the Ottoman Muslim Empire. So you can see this has been a fuel for a long period of time. And the person wasn't in the view of the authority. So that means that this was an individual who up until now had seemed like a general normal citizen. He wasn't someone that rung alarm bells for the, for the community and the police forces to kind of raise suspicion and awareness that this person perhaps is, God forbid, but about to do a very heinous act like which was done. But nevertheless, as Muslims, like I said, I mean, subhanAllah, for us now, we're kind of having, we're thinking and, and obviously we have the job now of addressing our communities and talking about what can, what can we learn from such a thing? Because Alhamdulillah for Muslims, we always remember one thing that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned the عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ الْأَمْرَ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٍ إِنَّ أَصْحَابَتْهُ صَرَّى فَشَكَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ وَإِنَّ أَصْحَابَتْهُ ضَرَّى فَصَبْرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ that the, uh, Amazing and ajeeb is, is the affair of a believer and a Muslim and all his affairs are of benefit to him. Now when he's afflicted with something good when I'm not afflicted, when that person has and experiences something good, that person says, Alhamdulillah, shukr alhamdulillah, fakana khayr allahu, this is good for him, better for him. Wa sabatu darra, and if any time, any time an affliction afflicts you, a, a, a something befalls you, a problem, a calamity, a circumstance befalls you, befalls you, you make sabr, fakana khayr allahu, this actual fact is better for you. So as Muslims, it's never, we don't lose. It's, it's, in essence, it's a win-win situation in the sense of akhirah. 
in terms of akhirah. But naturally, of course, with the, when you hear about innocent people dying, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, we, we also condemn when there's attacks against non-Muslims as well. Because as part of our faith, we believe that humanity is there. It's not like I'm going to say something negative against someone who attacks a Muslim, but yet when if someone attacks a non-Muslim, I'm not going to say anything. Of course not. I, I, I value life full stop. And part of the Sharia is hifadatun nasl. Hifadatun nafs, protection of progeny, protection of life. And this is something which is part and parcel of Islam. It's just that when we look at these things, this was something that had been bubbling for a long period of time. And it begs the question as to what led this person to be this way. Because they found a manifesto which he'd written. And in there he was making links and, and, and kind of references against immigration and multiculturalism. And he, he laments the so-called decaying of the culture of the white European West. And subhanAllah, it makes you think, what was he trying to achieve from this? Is it merely to create a panic amongst Muslims? Is it just to create, for example, now hatred between two communities, suspicions and so on? Only really Allah knows this at this moment in time, we don't really know for sure. As Muslims, like I said, what is our stance and how do we act, inshallah? This is what we will talk about it for a minute. But like I said, what caused this undoubtedly is you know, a constant bombardment because ever since September 2001, uh, September 11, 2001, there's been a constant, we hear in the media a lot more uh, about attacks on Islam as in before that. Okay, now I'm, like I said, I'm only in my 30s. I'm not that, that old, okay? But it, there's, if September 11th happened in my teens. And I do remember, there, I, up until that time about news and Muslims, I wasn't so aware. But I know that in the past 20 or so years, there's been a constant bombardment of media against Muslims constantly, subhanAllah. Now, okay, of course, don't get me wrong, we are also our own enemy to a certain extent because we've also done certain things. Okay, we're not gonna say that, we're not gonna say Muslims have always been innocent in terms of our actions. We also have to put up our hands and say as people, we've also failed to a certain degree. But that doesn't mean that as a whole community, we can scapegoat and say everyone is at fault. Everyone, like, blame the whole fraternity of Muslims. That's not fair to label every single in the whole community, especially when there are people from that community who stand up in opposition to people who think and do acts in the name of religion. So this is what they think, there was a con I, I feel that there's been a constant bombardment, and it's not just my views, there are views of others as well, of negative media representation of Muslims and immigrants as a whole. And also politicians, certain politicians will score points by talking about anti-Muslim rhetoric, anti-immigration rhetoric, anti-foreigner rhetoric. And unfortunately, we are seeing this kind of far right rise, and it's been happening steadily, you know, over the past few years. I mean, if you think about even the Brexit, which we have, it was fueled a lot of it by anti-immigration. The whole thing that we want our country back, we want it back. Who's taken it? Subhanallah. I don't understand. Back from who? You know, but there is this always constant thing. And Subhanallah, you know, I remember just even just the other day because I was li li watching about the backstop and the implications of uh, the recent kind of Theresa May deal flopped again. Uh, it led me to one particular thing I was watching about one guy and he said that we want our country back because we don't believe that we should be teaching GCSE in a Indian and this and that. And I was like, bruv, where in the country, tell me, do they teach GCSE Indian? Tell me. Where? I never, bruv, we wanted, we, I wanted to study Urdu. I wanted to, I couldn't find nowhere. You get me? So it's not this easy just to say, oh, this has happened, that's happened. A lot of time is bogus. And I'll give you an example, right? Do you remember that I mentioned a few weeks ago about the Trojan horse plot? You man remember that, yeah? Where there was this so-called thing where Muslims, it was, it was all fake, it was bogus about Muslims supposedly taking over schools. It was complete hoax. But where is the responsible media coverage? Where are our politicians who come in and say, hold on a second, this is wrong. Until you have not got concrete facts, we won't allow you to scapegoat a community. Where are all those politicians who then sing our thing one side when they want our votes, but at the same time, then they don't put certain measures in place to stop the attack against the whole community. Now, we are part and parcel of this society. We want good for this society. But when we see things like this taking place, as a Muslim, people can become quite skeptical and think, well, hold on a second. It seems at times there can be a double standard. So this is why we're saying that, you know, we as a community as well, obviously don't fall into this negative despair. Alhamdulillah, everything, you know, mashallah, we always think about the akhirah and so on. But as a wider community, we've got to wake up to this fact that there has been a positive contribution to immigrants worldwide, especially in UK. Especially in UK. Look, straight up, when I went to the doctor, I went to the hospital recently, right? And subhanAllah, you walk in and you see the name badges of those doctors. How many really British English doctors are you going to find? Let's be realistic. Let's be realistic. How many British English doctors are you going to find? 
How many British, English, so, uh, certain professions are you going to find which exclusively are a monopoly just for British people in this country? In our country, I say. It doesn't exist. There was a vacuum and that's why it got filled. That's why it got filled, because there was a need and people came from foreign countries. The, the, the doctor who, subhanAllah, you know, we recently we went to see a doctor for my son. The doctor wasn't British. He wasn't, I mean, he may be British, but he's not English per se. Anglo-Saxon typical thing, you know. He's from another country, and I need, need not mention his country. He's a migrant, but he gave, he's giving a positive, positive contribution to society. How, alhamdulillah, positive. Look at, for example, now, the transportation business in England. Is there's no denying how many people are involved in the transportation and business in UK. Is that not a positive contribution? They're not just sitting there just claiming benefits. How about shops, restaurants, takeaways, all these things? SubhanAllah, there's not an area you can go to where there has not been a positive influence in terms of food. So let, why is it that we've all got to think of the negative? Why not look at the positives? How much as a country we've been enriched by outsiders? And SubhanAllah, you know, there is this kind of negative portrayal. And unfortunately, I believe this is what has kind of given rise to such a thing in, 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 in where, we, where we live in. You know, SubhanAllah. But what is worrying and concerning is that as a result, what can happen is, is that there's going to be a potential sort of... Uh, some people might want to copy this act. Because if he was inspired, if he was inspired by the Alexandre the Bizanet and also the Luca Trini, who also did attacks. So obviously Alexandre did it on a mosque itself. He opened fire in Canada on a mosque. So if this guy was inspired by these people, what's there not to say tomorrow someone won't be inspired by him here or somewhere else? Do you guys get where I'm coming from, yeah? This is not just some typical, I'm not having a rant here. I'm actually thinking of the wider thing that as a community, we have to ask these questions. And I'm saying wider community. I'm saying Muslims and non-Muslims alike. We need to question what are the fundamental things that are causing this anti-Muslim rhetoric? Because it can't, not everyone is the same. How many Muslims do we have in UK? If everyone was a potential terrorist, there would no, be no country left in UK anymore. It wouldn't be existent. So we have a very small minority of Muslims. And we, we agree, there is going to be an extreme element and fringe element within our community. We do know that it can exist and does exist and it will happen. But a lot of the times, and I'm not justifying this at all, of course not. But you hear this often said. We attacked them because they attacked us, okay? That's the rhetoric you hear from the people who carry out certain things. Well, you attacked our country, you attacked our land. So if anything, we have to question our foreign policy. What are we doing in Iraq? What are we doing in Libya? What are we doing in these foreign countries? Is it not giving a backlash to people to think, well, hold on, if you're attacking me, I'm going to attack you. I've never heard anyone just say, I'm attacking you because I don't like pork. I'm attacking you because I don't like alcohol. I've never heard that. It always, what we hear is generally people are responding because of foreign policy. Now again, this, is, this ain't a politics lesson, you get me. I'm not here to talk about politics to that much extent. But we have to question, what is our foreign policy? What is our intervention in other countries which has and can cause a backlash? So we can't be blind to the ideas and say, no, no, I'm sorry, we don't want to talk about that. It's not for discussion. Or even the worst one, well, if you don't like it, leave. Right, what sort of answer is that? Okay. This guy who cites the takeover of the West, right? He's from New Zealand. Who are the indigenous people of New Zealand? They're not whites. They're aborigines. And one of the guys also, a part of the group, three are, you know, there's one main guy, three others that are also involved. Obviously, there's more information to come up. But one was Australian, apparently. Allegedly, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was from... Now, check this out. <laughs> Bro, where did you come from? Where did you come from? Aborigines were the indigenous people of Australia. At what point do we say immigration stops? You're no longer a migrant. Because if I'm third, fourth generation in this country, at what point now do I not be considered as an immigrant anymore? At what point? Because this guy was saying he's standing up for, you know, and there is like sort of elements of white supremacy and so on going on, standing up for the, the so-called decaying of the culture of the white European West. At what point did you go from being an invader of New Zealand, your forefathers, to becoming socially acceptable and being now the, the, the indigenous people? Well, not indigenous, but now it's your country. At what point? So is there, a, is there a line that once you cross this many generations, you're no longer considered a migrant? What, where is the defining line? So this is why we say, subhanAllah, there's always this anti-immigrant, all this stuff we hear all the time. This is fueling the problem. It's fueling the problem. Now look, I've got a couple of minutes, so I need to wrap this up. From a Muslim point of view, from a Muslim point of view, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah, no, it's not the verse. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salah. Allah Ta'ala mentions, whenever a difficulty befalls us, what is he saying? Ista'inu bis sabri wa salah. Seek help by Allah in two things. 
sabr and patience, number one. And secondly, in seeking Allah, beseeching Allah, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's help is directly with those who are patient. He says, don't ever say, don't ever say that those who are killed and slain in his path are dead. They are alive, yet you do not perceive that. You don't perceive that, you don't know, but they are alive. How? Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, those shuhada, those people who, 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 are, who, are, who die in the cause of Allah, their rules are put in the stomachs of green birds. They are perched underneath the arsh of Allah. They roam around in Jannah as and when they please. Okay, so for us, obviously there's a lamenting loss of dunya, but in terms of akhirah, absolutely not. Okay, let me carry on with this thing. Allah Ta'ala then goes on to mention, He will definitely test us. He will most definitely, definitely test you. Fear, jur, hunger, naqsim min al-amwal, depreciation of wealth, wal anfus and life and the loss of, of, of thamarat and fruits and so on. Wa bashir sabirin and thamarat also translated as provisions. But Allah said, give glad tidings to those who are, who are, who are patient. Whenever a, a musibah afflicts them, what do they say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We're from Allah, we will return to Allah. Then Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمًا On these individuals who exercise patience in, in, in face of calamity, in face of difficulty, in times when trials have come their way, when they make sabr and patience, Allah will spend down His special rahmah and mercy on these types of individuals. Okay? So listen, we don't need to go, you know, we don't need to lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same Allah was there a million years ago, same Allah now, same Allah again in another million years time. That hasn't changed. And also in regards to these people, let me tell you this much as well. Allah ta'ala has used them to give them martaba and status. On the day, they, when did they get, when did they, when did they become shaheed? When did they become martyrs? On what day? Jumu'ah, Friday. Where? In the masjid. At going for salah, Allahu Akbar. They were in, they were on their way to salah, subhanAllah. They were in the masjid, in an environment of malaika, when Sakina is descending on such a crowd and gathering. Friday, Jumu'ah, in the masjid, in the state of wudu, listening to the khutbah, listening to deen. And in that instance, people lost their lives. From an akhirah point of view, from an akhirah point of view, these people are not failures. By Allah, they are successful. By Allah, they're successful. From an akhirah point of view, we lament the loss of dunya. We lament and we are upset over the loss and what is harmed and difficulty that has caused the families. But let me tell these people, don't, don't lose hope and don't take heed from such a thing. Allah will use this example to give them martaba and status in the akhirah. A Muslim thinks, ask yourself a question. What are, you, are you here just for dunya or akhirah? I'm here for Akhirah. Then worry about more of the loss of Akhirah than dunya. Again, I say this, we're not, we're not downplaying it. It's, it's awful what happened. Innocent people were killed, subhanAllah, innocent people. But as Muslims, we need to avert our nazar and think, okay, it's a loss, it's painful, it's saddening, it's sickening. However, from an Akhirah point of view, their lives have not gone in vain. By Allah, they will be rewarded as soon as they're, they're before the qatra of blood hit the ground, all of their sins have been forgiven. Then they will be roaming in Jannah. And in Akhirah, they will enter into Jannah smiling without reckoning. So this is why we say, as Muslims, we need to keep control, keep calm, and think to ourselves, obviously not everyone is like that. Alhamdulillah, the, the greater public, they know. You have one Ikaduka people like this, but we also have, unfortunately, similar people when it also within our faith as well. And like we say, it's not fair to label one person and to label a community. We've said the same thing as well. Also, likewise, because of one person, we can't say all of the people are like that. All we're asking for is to ask those fundamental questions as to what has given rise to such thinking and to challenge that thinking and be given the right also to challenge such. But as Muslims, we finish here and just say this one thing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward those families of their patience. They are going to definitely be going through a musibah and difficulty. But by Allah, if they are patient in this time of difficulty, uqsim billah, this can be a sabab and a means for them even in entering into Jannah as well. May Allah grant them khair and grant them afi and grant them goodness and bring stability, peace and afiyah across the whole globe, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.